Some giant news just dropped this morning with Sandy Monroe from Monroe & Associates dropping a bombshell interview of Elon Musk. Elon was able to share some very, very interesting nuggets. Today, we'll be watching the key segments from the video. The big one for me was his comments, not just about the Cybertruck, but about the new compact car. Elon said that they're far ahead in the production ramp process, and he's actually been actively overseeing this ramp. He made sure to point out that the production itself is revolutionary and no one makes cars like the way they do with a compact car. Now, was he referring to the new unbox process only or perhaps he was referring to the use of humanoid robots? Apparently, Giga Texas is going to be the first factory to produce this car. Giga Mexico is coming next. We've got Hans Nelson joining us. He has his own YouTube channel called Hans C. Nelson. Hans, this is very, very exciting. Very excited to get into this. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for pointing this out. This video, this interview with Elon Musk just dropped this morning. Fantastic nuggets. Let's get started with the big one, of course, is his comments about the Model 2, the compact car. Let's watch this. The other guys that are also uh, dying to get a Tesla, the $25,000 Tesla. And so I'm wondering, where, where is that exactly? Where, where are you with that? Yeah, unfortunately, because we're a publicly traded company, I cannot comment on things that would have uh, a material impact on our financials. Uh, okay, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyways, I, um, I'm hoping that that's not too far down the line. I really, really would like to see something where we can, um, where like this one here, uh, I'm told that uh, the one that, the, I, I'm looking for the beast, the tri-motor and everything. Yeah. And, um, and I'd like to get two of those in that vehicle is like a hundred plus grand. I think that, I think that that's the right price for this, but it's not the right price for the, for the kid that wants to take one to uh, college or whatnot. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of anxious to find out what, what it is that can be done for those uh, others that, uh, that want to get into electrification, but can't. So if we can't do that, then let me shift gears. And what do you think about well, the new? I can say a little bit. I just can't tell you, you know, unit volume and dates because that yeah. has a mass. Uh, that then that is a uh, that is projecting the financials. Yeah. Um, so we obviously are we are working on a low cost electric vehicle that will be made in very high volume. Um, we're like, quite far advanced in that work. The, you know, I review the. The, the production line plans for that every week, um, and I think the 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 revolution in manufacturing that will be represented by that car. It is not like any car production line that anyone's ever seen. Is this going to have the um, basically um, unboxed system, or would this be too much of a question asked? The, the thing, the thing that's most interesting about this is, is it's a production system. It's, it's a level of production technology that is uh, far in advance of any automotive plant on Earth. Not can early wait. No. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be cool. It's gonna be very cool. Um, sure. Yeah, I think we're, you know, um, and, and I should point out the uh, that that we will be making that the. the the, the first production line will be here in the Gigafactory in Texas, in, 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 this, in this facility. Oh, I thought it was going to be in Mexico or something. That'll be the second place. That's a really exciting revelation on Elon's part. Obviously, we had heard in the Walter Isaacson biography that they were going to be doing the next-gen vehicle platform manufacturing starting in Austin. But it's great to hear this directly from Elon. And so this is going to be the place where they set up the first line. Now, there's going to be, obviously, a lot more lines than the first one. And the ones after this first one in Austin are going to be down in Mexico. At least that's the current plan. Um, but hearing Elon say that this manufacturing production system is going to be different than anything else on Earth, and then to have, you know, Sandy knows about the unbox process and what that's supposed to look like. And then, so for him to ask, you know, are we just talking about the unbox process? And Elon respond in a way that is not just saying, yeah, that's it. You know, everything that we showed you at Investor Day is what I'm talking about. It seems like there's more that he has in mind when he's talking about what that's going to look like than just what we know about the unbox process. And so, you know, the first place that my mind goes is obviously, what is the status of the Optimus robot? We know that the unbox process has been designed, 
in order to actually have Optimus robots be part of that process. And so, you know, I'm sure that that is definitely one of the possibilities, but, you know, this team has not been sitting still since they released their plans for the Unbox process earlier this year, and there could be new innovations that they've made since then that we don't know about. And so I'm really excited to see, you know, what those uh, innovations are going to be. And my mind is kind of whirling on, you know, what what are the further possibilities beyond what we've seen so far that um, that the Tesla team yeah. could be working on? Yeah. So for me, it was like two big things he said, right? So first of all, very reassuring that he said that we are well on its way for this production line well on its way. I've been personally overseeing this mm -hmm. production line. The confidence in the way he said that was uh, reassuring. You know, people thought that this was delayed. Well, we're so focused on Cybertruck. Compact car is on its way. We're going to do it in Giga Austin, uh, Austin first, Texas, before we do Giga Mexico. Um, so that was just fantastic. And then, yeah, what does he mean by this is going to be revolutionary? Um, I think it might be human or robots, right? That's I, I think you're right. That I there certainly might be hope so. There. It, it's it, it, like you just said, it's got to be more than just the uh, the Unbox model. This is something that regardless, even if it's not bots, it's still very exciting the way he was very confident about it. So let's, uh, I think that's big news and exciting news. Let's talk about the Cybertruck. There was a couple points he made, but one of the points he made was that this was not a better company kind of model, why they went all out for this. Let's just listen, listen to uh, what he said here those and popping them in and I mean all the all the glorious stuff you did with the um, with how uh, manufacturing should be done I, I it drives me wild uh, why other people haven't done anything but again I it, it I I don't know it I, I hate to start dro drooling all over you but I think it's just great leadership I okay. um, I really I really appreciate that so yeah I mean I push things very hard on engineering front. Um, so um, I, I, we would have been more adventurous uh, actually with, you know, with the Model 3 or Model Y, but we, we couldn't take a chance on uh, on being too radical because if, if those were bet the company cars. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with the Cybertruck, it's no longer a bet the company situation. So we have the freedom to be adventurous here. Hmm. So let me ask uh, an adventurous question. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I made a lot of noise about what I think the future is going to look like. And one of the things that I've said is that probably uh, the biggest car company on the planet will be BYD. And then I'm putting Tesla in on second simply because BYD has got such a head start. Sorry about that. I cut it in the wrong place, but uh, I think he just completes that sentence. Uh, Elon says that it's any company that's willing to be able to kind of um, adapt to the times and make changes. I will play the second part of it when he talks about the um, the engineering is so important. But mm -hmm. what, what's your thoughts on on his comments there? Bet the company. Yeah. So I mean, that's one of the things. If you go back to the Model X, that it was a very complicated product and he had said afterwards you know if i could go back and do it again you know i don't know if we would have made some of the ambitious design choices that we made originally to put in the falcon wing doors and you know just a number of things it was a, a product that was basically a faberge egg and so the cybertruck is kind of getting back to some of that very adventurous and risky design approach that they had with the model x that they haven't really had with the model 3 and the model y and exactly for the reasons that he stated that you know those were critical products that had to not only had to get right, but they had to get to huge volumes on those. Um, and so complicating the manufacturing process uh, was something that was more difficult uh, for those products. Because, you you know, if you want to make a million, a million and a half, two million Model Ys a year, then you need to make sure that that product is a product that you can replicate at high quality, easily and repeatably. Um, the Cybertruck, you know, we've seen so far that the, the stated goal is 250,000 vehicles per year, which is a little bit more than they're selling in SNX combined, but you know, it's kind of still a niche product. Now, hopefully I would love to see them make a lot more than that. I'd love to see anywhere from 300 to 500,000 a year units of the Cybertruck. I think that the market could definitely absorb that type of production. 
at the cost that Tesla will be able to supply those to the market, um, especially if you get into 2027 to 2030 in, in that time frame. But um, it allows them, you know, if they're not shooting for that 500,000, a million, 2 million um, run rate in the near future, then they actually have a little bit more wiggle room to, to have a product that's a little bit more difficult to manufacture. And then they can work out a bunch of the technologies that are going to be critical for the next gen vehicle platform, but they can do it in the more niche manufacturing realm of the Cybertruck and get things dialed in and get them just right. And so that your 48 volt architecture is going to be one of those things. Your steer by wire um, system is going to be one of those things. I'm sure that the, some of the processes that we don't really get to see in the manufacturing are also going to be piloting some of the technology that they're going to be using either in the unbox process or whatever it is that's even more than just the unbox process. Um, and so if they can use this as a development platform, it allows them, and I'm sure that that is a huge component in one of the reasons it took them quite as long to get to this is because you know, they, they were basically supply constrained. They couldn't even make as many Model 3s and Model Ys as the market was demanding. That's why prices were higher here recently is because they were so significantly supply constrained. So you, you can't even make the core models, the Model 3 and the Model Y, at the volumes that you want to make them, then there's no reason to add another model of complexity. So that gives them a little bit of extra time. They're like, okay, well, if we have these, you know, because France has been deep into the design work, not only for the Cybertruck, but for those other models that we've seen under the little covers. So you've got the, what looks to be some sort of a van, um, the next gen vehicle platform, like those things have been actively in the design phase for a long time. Yeah. And those products are only more and more refined the deeper into time that we get. And so I'm sure there's technologies from those platforms that they're actually getting brought back down to the Cybertruck before it was released um, in order to do this further refinement of those technologies. And, you know, like we said, as a playground to make sure that we get them right, get them dialed in. Um, and so I'm really excited about all of that and to see where it goes. Yeah, this is that's the big point, right? That we just said, which is is not just the Cybertruck, it's not just how beautiful it looks, it's everything inside and the production line and all the technologies that they're doing. You'd mentioned volume targets, uh, then one of us play the clip on Elon talking about volume targets for the Cybertruck and then the supply constraint issue. Uh, let's let's go listen to this. I got another question then. What are you looking at? I've been asked uh, um, Bloomberg and the uh, um, I don't know, a bunch of, bunch of these different news magazines have been asking me, what's the, you know, volume going to be for this thing, uh, say in 12 months? What are you looking at? Well, uh, we have to be cautious about forward-looking statements as a public, publicly traded company. Um, oh. This is not a, and it's also very difficult to forecast the production ramp in the beginning, because the production ramp always is like this very difficult S-curve which means the production is very slow in the beginning. Um, you're constrained by whatever the least lucky, least competent thing out of 10,000 items is. Yeah. So. A weak uh, link. Yeah, th there's at least 10,000 unique parts and processes required to scale production. And whatever the, the like I said, the least lucky, uh, dumbest thing in the whole system, and it could be, something complicated or something trivial, that actually sets your, your output rate. Um, so it's difficult, it's very difficult to predict the slope of that S-curve. Um, that's why, you know, it's, and, 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 and even just a few months difference, one way or the other, can really change the unit volume. Um, the, but the, 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 the Cybertruck is not something that will be material to, the, to Tesla's uh, financials next year. Um, Meaning it will not, you know, of the vehicles we make, it will be a, a, a still such a small percentage that it will not be material in 2024. It will probably be material in 2025. Yeah. Well, um, I, when we went down, they were dry cycling the machines and whatnot. And, um, you know, I, I'm a pretty good guesser. And, um, and it looked to me like this thing could be produced at uh, 60, well, one every 60 seconds, 60 jobs an hour, whatever you want. It, yeah, it seemed to be somewhere in there. And your other ones, are, when I went through here before, 
uh, the model Y was doing about 43 seconds, and I got exactly the same number when I went through, uh, <clears throat> when I went through, um, what do you call it, uh, Berlin. Um, so I think at 60, uh, 60 jobs per hour is kind of like where everybody else is. Nobody's at 43. Nobody. So that you're unique. That that's that's great for the uh, uh, for the three and the um, and, and the Y. Um, uh, I'm just hoping this thing will ramp up quickly. Comments on that? Yeah, there's a couple of different directions we could go with this. One of them is just to you know reiterate the point that Jeff has made with you that is a very important point that there are so many new things on this vehicle that I, when there are new things, not only is it new from a technology standpoint, but it's also new from a supply chain standpoint. And really the supply chain aspect is going to be the thing that limits the ramp of the Cybertruck. I would say much more so there's going to be, you know, headaches as they try and ramp up these lines in the factory and get all of the machines dialed in and all of that stuff. That's definitely part of it. But I would say overall, the biggest thing that's going to hinder the ramp speed of the uh, of the Cybertruck is going to be the supply chain. And with all these new components that they're adding into it, um, that is going to be even slower. It, and I think this is good for Elon to be setting expectations low for deliveries in 2024 for Cybertruck, but saying that it's actually going to be material to the financials of Tesla, probably not, you know, assuredly, but probably in 2025. That's kind of a big deal because even, you know, even if they only produce 250,000 Cybertrucks a year in 2025, if that's, you know, if, if they reached a run rate at the end of 2024, that is 250. And then they produce 250 in 2025, or you know, maybe they enter at a, a lower run rate, but they exit at a higher run rate, and it, it averages out that way. Um, for only a quarter of a million vehicles to have a material impact on the financials means that the margins that they're expecting should be pretty impressive. Um, and that is actually good news to Tesla investors. The other thing that I wanted to say is, you know, a lot of people have criticized the have criticized Tesla and Elon specifically for talking about the Cybertruck so early and then waiting so long to release it. You know, how come Ford was actually able to beat Tesla in releasing the Lightning into the market? And um, while Elon, you know, took so much longer on the Cybertruck, I think there's a couple of things at play there. First of all, you know, the Lightning is, just like everyone said, this, you know, it's a more normal truck. There was a lot less engineering development that went into the Lightning than has gone into the Cybertruck. And that was one of the great you know, takeaways from the uh, curmudgeon show that John Camisa did. Um, but just talking about how the Cybertruck really advances the art of the design of the pickup truck. And there's a lot of things that you know people love, a lot of people are a lot of things that people are not necessarily going to like, but there's a lot of the under the hood engineering stuff that's going on with the Cybertruck that's really going to radically transform the way that trucks are made for the next 100 years. And so all of that takes time. That's part of it. The other thing is that when you know, when Tesla gets to 250 to 300,000 year or units per year of production, that actually accounts for a much larger percentage of Tesla's overall business than if the Lightning were to reach that same number of production just because the, um, you know, Ford makes a lot more vehicles currently than Tesla makes and, and they get much lower margins. Um, and so, you know, for them to produce 20, 30, 40,000 um, Lightnings, that's great. For them, and you know, it's good for EVs, um, but they're not doing it with a a design that is really pushing the boundaries. It's very, it, very for very much further behind where Tesla is on a number of fronts, um, and then it's it's not as big of an overall impact to their business, and so that's one of the reasons why they're able to you know get something out there, have it be okay start dipping their toes on the water. Um, whereas for Tesla, not only is it the things that we talked about earlier that, you know, ramping the Cybertruck would have stolen parts that would have meant that they had Model 3s and Model Ys that the market demanded that they couldn't sell. And it also, so that stacked on top of, hey, we want to get this product right. We actually want to push 
the boundaries on manufacturing, not only for pickup trucks, but also for all of the other vehicles that we develop in the future. And, mm. and we want to get this product so right that when it finally comes to market, that it really is, you know, this is a halo product in my opinion. And we've seen this now, the amount of traffic that the Cybertruck brings into Tesla stores. And then the interest that that creates, oh, like people, wow, I didn't realize that EVs could do all of these things. I didn't realize they were so cheap to operate. I didn't realize this, that, and the other. And, um, you know, it actually, I think, will drive demand for the entire Tesla brand more so than, you know, the Plaid is a cool car. But at the end of the day, it's still just a four-door sedan. Yes, it's the fastest four-door sedan in the world, but it's not going to turn heads like the Cybertruck. And so this is basically you know, the type of impact that they would have from releasing a Roadster, except there's going to be hundreds of thousands of these things on the road over time instead of, you know, a handful. And all of those eyeballs that get put on the Cybertruck are going to drive that demand. And so actually getting that right, waiting till the right time to have all the right technology, make sure all the pieces are in the right place, have your supply chain. All of that was much, much more critical for the Cybertruck than it was for Ford just to get a pickup truck that has a battery pack in the floor pan out the door. Yeah, it's good to hear Elon confirm that this is uh, this is what wasn't a bed of the company kind of thing, and so they could take their time, but really perfect the production, the technology, and like you said, um, supply chain was one of the big issues, and he mentioned it. What I like what he said was that there's this uh, S-curve, very, very slow, and then it goes really fast. And this is where many people are still again yet again kind of thinking oh it's going to be very slow therefore it's going to be small numbers it's going to be a niche product in the future no this was designed for manufacturing first and once they nail this particularly his confidence wasn't just about the production his issue is the supply chain and once they nail the supply chain and they get everything uh you know the least lucky part is available then this thing's going to start flying flying it's already at 60 cars per uh, hour. So that means every 60 seconds, there's a car. That's already pretty freaking amazing at this point when you're just launching it and they can improve it. Okay, let's listen to the supply chain issue. That's the reason why the Model 3, Model Y were reduced. And let's listen to that part. What was the biggest hold holdup? I mean, everybody's been you know, holding their breath for, for uh, at least four years. So what what really was the, the biggest uh, the biggest challenge? Um, well, uh, I think people sometimes forget, you know, it's not like we're, we're going to deliver the car in 2019. We announced the car in 2019. I think we sort of expected perhaps that we'd be in production in 20, you know, a couple of years later in 21 or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there was a worldwide pandemic um, then there was yeah. a global chip shortage, yeah. um, and uh, there were shortages of, of so many parts. It would be irrelevant for us to bring to market a, a car for which that we simply do not have parts to make. Yeah. Hmm. So that's a that's a pretty good reason. Yeah. So I've got a, <laughs> I mean, it would add. It would I add, got no parts. It would, would add complexity. Yeah. Mean, but we would not ship yeah. any incremental units. And that's that's. Uh, it would actually make the make the company worse. Yeah. So at the end of the day. Um, I wasn't going to try and answer that question. You know, a lot of people have been asking. Well, first off, we were under a, an NDA kind of thing, and then and then people were asking me the same question over and over again. And I'm thinking, you know what? This would be a good time for you to shut up, Sandy, and let's find out for sure. And that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, uh, it just wasn't there. We couldn't make them. So now, well, I the mean, for a few years there, we 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 actually uh, couldn't even make enough of the Model Y and Model Three. Uh, we yeah. were we were actually production constrained because of of multiple pod storages. So the, yeah. the, the global pandemic shut down massive sections of the global supply chain. Yeah, um, well, so, it was true for everyone. Yeah, I mean, there was everyone. nobody, nobody was immune to that stuff. Right. But, um, so, so it was just, we, if, we, if we can't even make enough of the cars that we have already designed, what's the point of bringing a new one to market? Right. I like that, eh? If we can't make enough of the part, of the part, what's the point of bringing a new one to model? But so this was not delayed because of what people were thinking that, you know, the uh, because of production issues or, you know, concerns about manufacturing. No, this was just simply supply issues. The, there was a global pandemic that happened. Uh, your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I kind of, I jumped the gun a little bit on the last, uh, you know, on the last segment, but it's all those things that I just mentioned about the not being able to produce enough Model 3, you know, they needed to ramp up production on Model 3 and Model Y as much as possible 
And so, you know, trying to bring Cybertruck to market in the middle of, I can't make enough Model 3s and Model Ys, it just doesn't make yeah. sense. Um, and, and so then, you know, someone might say, well, yeah, Ford was able to do it. And that's why, where I would go back to the point that I made earlier that, yeah, it was a, you know, Ford didn't ramp production of F-150 meaningfully. They knew they didn't have enough demand to just make an infinite number of F-150 Lightnings and have people actually purchase them. Um, so they're kind of testing the water to see, is there demand for this product? Whereas with 2 million reservations for Cybertruck, you know, you can't release this car and then never ramp up production beyond 10, 20, 30, 40,000 units a year for years and years and years on end when you have a backlog of 2, 2 million orders. So they had to be ready to actually ramp as quickly as they could once they released it. So that's the only yeah extra point that I would make on that one. Perfect. This was fun. It was great to examine the, the we the really just the key points that we got from this interview. Lots of great nuggets. Thank you so much, Hans. Follow him on his YouTube channel, Hans C. Nelson. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.